This morning is uh, Sunday. It is September 22nd, 2013. Our message is called Certain Places. Amen? Now, y'all going to have to talk to me this morning or else I'll run out and cry and we'll all be embarrassed, right? We're not going to let that happen, are we? You going to talk to me this morning, Nick? All right. So uh, turn with me to Acts 17. We'll be in the 26th verse. I just got back from Peru and was blessed to have a team with me that really worked hard to hear from God. And I want to tell you that the book of Acts is not something that used to happen. It's something that is ongoing. It's something that is present. What we need to do is be where the Lord says to be when he says to be there. And then he will do the work that he intended to do there. If we busy ourselves doing the things we like and avoid everything that we dislike, it's very hard to achieve something for God. Uh, I only say that because we live in a society that wants to buy books that says how easy Christianity is and what a champion you already are. And I have not found anything further from the truth. The further I press into the king, the more I'm intimately aware of my own weaknesses and failings, but also dependent upon his grace and his power. And he never fails to not only show me my own life soberly, but also to breathe life into me and say, you can go further and you can go higher because I will empower you to do it. Amen. So we don't need to shortcut this thing and just tell you that you're already perfected. And we don't need to stunt this thing and tell you that you are just a sinner. Neither are true. The truth is that we began as sinners and now we are counting ourselves dead to sin and pressing on towards Christ where we are seated in the right hand of God in the heavenly realms. With all of my heart, I hope today to deliver to you a special word. But it starts in Acts 17. Here's the 26th verse. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. Somebody say exact places. Now you may think that you chose to live in Texas, but I tell you God chose for you to live here if you do. You may think that it was a mistake to move to Port Lavaca because now you have to drive two and a half hours to church, but I tell you, he set the exact places where you should live. Why did he do it? God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. God was good enough to put boundaries in our lives. He is good enough to put obstacles that the Bible refers to often as goads, or in the King James pricks, little ways in which you could be steered into his will. There was a reason for that. 1 Timothy 2, the uh, third verse, teaches us, This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. The living God did not set this in motion and then back away from it. He didn't just cause the earth to be created and put man on it as the crown jewel of his creation and then let it go and say, oh no, it's going to hell in a handbasket. He didn't do that. He's not a hands-off God. He's a God that is so intimately involved in your life that he has put boundaries in places to keep you from getting too far from him. He has planted you in places in the hopes that you'll reach out and find him. He did that because he desires that all men would be saved. Not a few men, not some men, not white men, not black men, all men to be saved. It is His will that all human beings experience His goodness. That says something about our God. The gospel stories are full of what it is like to know the Lord. A leper comes to Jesus in the uh, book of Luke and he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus looked at him and said, I am willing. This message that the gospel brings us says that God is willing to make a difference in your life if you're willing to do what he says. Amen. Anybody in here ever follow a recipe? Jana, you ever bake anything? I thought I saw a few empty tins in your house when I was there. If you trust the chef, you follow the recipe. The degree to which you break away from the recipe shows your disdain for the chef's original recipe. If you trust the living God, then you must live by his word. That's how you get the result that he wants. 
the result that you want. To the degree that we vary from it, the degree that we sin, we're going to get something else. And the problem is you will eat the life that you made. Some of us have sown things in our lives that have not been pleasing, but God wants us to be saved. Turn to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 is a verse I've never heard quoted in church, and so I thought I'd bring it this morning. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when He divided up all mankind, He set boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. The living God apportioned out the nations. When you look at Ham, Shem, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, there were 70 that came from them. Jews say that there are 70 nations in the world. God set up boundaries for each nation, and He did it keeping in mind the number of the sons of God or sons of Israel. Depends on what your footnote would say. I want you to understand, He never wanted there to be so many people that the few that had his revelation could not reach the masses who did not. He always apportioned this in a way where there was a relationship between the priest and the rest of the world. This is because he desires that all men would be saved. And he determined that you would sit here today. He determined that you would live where you live. And some of you that have recently moved, it's an act of God that does that. Do you really think that you just decided to pick up and sell your house and change states and uproot your kids from school and do all the things that you did? The Lord is able to steer a people who are willing to be steered. He wants all men to be saved. And so He's either in the business of saving you or preparing you to go preach salvation to those that are lost. But there is nobody that is not in one of those two categories, either the saved or the part of the team that is preaching salvation to the rest of the world. There's a great proclamation that has to go out to the whole world. And you know what? It doesn't matter how high the mountains are. It doesn't matter how yucky it is under the bridge. It doesn't matter what it's like. He desires all men to be saved. What did it take for the Lord to bring you to this place today? What is it take what is it taken for the Lord to save your life thus far? Said but pastor you know I'm already saved. I don't know about you but I was saved, I'm being saved and I will be saved in the future. The Lord's not done with me yet and my little USDA Christian sinner's prayer 20 years ago was not all there is to salvation. He is saving me daily, and I am dependent upon him daily. Verse 9, for the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted inheritance. In a desert land he found him. In a barren and howling waste he shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. How much does the Lord care for you? He would no sooner let somebody harm you than to jab their finger into the center of his eye. Apple of your eye is the pupil of your eye. He's got his eyes upon us, saints. He desires that they call on his name in India. He desires that they call upon his name in Iran. His spirit is moving in people to liberate the sons of God around the earth because he desires that all men would be saved. And the job is not too big because he apportioned it according to the number of those that are already his. And he set boundaries for the others so that they could reach out and find him and not be too far from him. Have you ever read the book of Acts and seen that the spirit of Jesus allowed them to go into one place and disallowed them to go into another? God has apportioned a day of salvation for all mankind. The question is, will you find your day? He found his people in a barren wasteland. How many of you have heard of jailhouse religion? Come on now. You can speak. You don't just have to raise your hand. Dustin, have you heard of jailhouse religion? What do people say about jailhouse religion, Mike? Oh, man, you get saved while you're in prison because it's there that you're all pressed and beat up. But when you get out, you forget all about it. I don't think there's any other kind of religion other than jailhouse religion, to be honest. If you weren't so imprisoned by your own sin, if you didn't see yourself a slave and him set you free, then you never really got saved. 
We're not pretty good old boys that just come to Jesus. That's not how this works. We're monstrous sinners in the hands of God. And yet in that situation, he stands between you and what would kill you. He puts his hand, as Job 9 says, upon you and upon God, and he makes peace. And when that happens, we have an obligation. We have an obligation to help our brothers be reconciled to God and come to the truth. Does anybody feel that obligation for the great proclamation? With all of my heart, it's been a beating passion for 20 years. I can't keep it silent because the living God buried it in my heart on the day that he saved me. Have you ever thought about why you? I mean, he spoke to me, saints. In 1993, he spoke to me audibly and it knocked me down. I was not righteous. I was not pristine, I was not pure, I was a sinful, selfish teenager. I'd had thoughts of suicide, my life was filled with lust and ugliness. I was angry and violent and I had scars on my body to prove it. He didn't wait for me to get right before he came for me. But once he came for me, I decided to follow him forever. I don't believe in a Christianity that stops and starts with a prayer at an altar and that's it. It should be a relentless pursuit of the Savior. It should be a go forth and sin no more. It should be I will step where you step. You know, the first five books of the Bible tell a story that we miss in English. In English, we hear Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But in the original language, this is not what they're called. They're actually named according to the first few Words in each book. Genesis is Bereshith. It means in the beginning. Uh, Exodus is Shemot. These are the names. Leviticus, Veigra, he called. Numbers is Bemidbar. It means in the desert. In Deuteronomy, Devarim, these are the words. Think about the message that that speaks. In the beginning, these are the names he called while they were in the desert and gave them his word. The people were in a wasteland. How does the Bible begin? The earth was tohu vavohu. It was formless and void. Darkness was over the face of the waters. This is the state of the man who is outside of God. Darkness covered his life in a desert that he's going to die in. But God sends his light. And that light begins to separate light from darkness. It begins to bring an order to a life so that man can again reign with God. The first few verses of the Bible tell the entire story and the rest is a kind of commentary on that story. We don't have a right to excerpt it. And we don't have a right to say, because I was saved from the desert, I don't care about those who were still out there in the desert. While we were in Peru, we went without a plan. We went without an interpreter. We went without provisions. We went with a Bible and a backpack. Do you know why? Because in Luke 10, that's how Jesus sent them out, and we just thought we didn't have the right to improve upon Jesus' plan. It was disconcerting. Brent, was it disconcerting? I snuck four pounds of beef jerky in my pack because I'm fat. And I didn't want to go hungry. I came back with four pounds of beef jerky. We never needed it. The Lord forgive me for my unbelief. Walking down about six hours down an incline that it shouldn't say stair master, it should say mastered by stairs. <laughs> Twisted an ankle. I thought, oh no, I'm the old man on the trip, and the brothers are gonna have to carry me out, and they're all half my size except Michael, and he looks tired. <laughs> but we prayed, and there was healing. A word was given. That when we got to Peru, we should look for a woman in a blue shirt and two mules would be involved. How ridiculous. Who goes to another nation on a word like that? A woman in a blue shirt and two mules. The person who gave it said they felt stupid giving it, but just wanted to to get it out there so that there would be accountability. Funny how the Lord will make you look like an idiot for a while, huh? He's not at all interested in your pride. Not even a little bit. He's interested in his glory. What do you think we found when we got to the bottom of the valley? We found a woman. 
blue shirt and two mules. Those two mules carried the bags, even with my sinful beef jerky in it. And that man became an emissary to every village that we went to. And he spoke both languages everywhere we went. And he was a man who was estranged from God, but now had been reunited with his father. He's a man now who is fit to be an elder in a village in training, fit to be a pastor in training. And how did it begin? Because Charlton Heston spoke and said, Thou shalt go? No. Because a bunch of crazy people that believe that God speaks today said, We believe He wants us to go to Peru, and all we know is we're not supposed to bring much, and we'll meet a woman in a blue shirt with two mules. You have to be stupid to do things like that. And yet, God chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wisdom of the wise. I'm going to tell you, usually when you hear testimonies like that, you hear what great men of faith carried it out. I don't know if there are any great men of faith. I'm going to be honest. I think that there is a great God who is moved by faith and really ordinary men who are leaning on Him in extraordinary ways. I think the day of the superhero Christian is just gone. I don't believe in spiritual green berets. I've heard it all. I've seen all of the macho bravado. And in the end, there are just men who either trust the Lord or don't. The rest is foolishness. But when you throw in your lot with Him and you trust Him and you're vulnerable and you can tell Him when you're scared and when you're hurt and when you're not sure, but you go anyway, He meets you in the midst of that. There is a spot, friends, a certain place where He wants you to be at a certain time. Turn with me to Luke 19. Say there when you're there. Three of you are there. What's going to happen to the rest of us? Are you just waiting on the screen? I'm going to say, they didn't know what I was saying in Peru and they amen better than this. Hold on, let me show you how to do this, okay? Amen, Pastor, we're there. You want to practice? Give me one, Nolan. How's it go? Amen, Pastor, we're there. Okay, see, we're like family. It's not hard to do. Not hard at all. You in Luke 19? Amen. Amen. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. In the Bible, Jericho is often symbolic of the world at large. This is because the people of God stood on the wrong side of the Jordan. They had to look across the Jordan, which was a barrier, and there stood Jericho. Jericho was symbolic of the kingdoms of the world. Yeshua, Joshua, led the people of God around Jericho seven times in seven days. It's a miracle story there. And on the seventh day, after marching around it seven times, the walls to the kingdom of the world fell, and it became the possession of the sons of of God. Jericho is a unique place in all of Bible history. A curse was pronounced over Jericho that at the cost of laying its foundation would be the man who did its firstborn son. You know why? Because the living God said to destroy this kingdom of the world and rebuild it as mine, it would cost me my firstborn son. Jericho is special in the Bible. So Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. That's like saying Yeshua was entering the world and passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Do you like Zacchaeus? I mean, if that's all you know about Zacchaeus, don't act like you don't make superficial judgments. Do you like him? When you meet a wealthy chief tax collector, you already don't like him, do you? He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. Was it Zacchaeus' fault he was short? Did he wake up in the morning and say, Dear God, please make me vertically challenged? You think he put encyclopedias on his head? Zacchaeus was born short. And friends, whether we like Zacchaeus or not at first glance, there's something of Zacchaeus in all of our lives. There is something that we are born into that is inherently selfish. 
inherently short of the glory of God, inherently flawed. But this guy, although he's short, although he's flawed, although he's a wealthy tax collector, which in the Bible days is among the worst kind of sinners you could be, he wants something. He wants to see Jesus. I'm going to tell you, Timothy tells us Jesus wanted to see him. God wants the Zacchaeuses of the world to be saved. What happens if we won't pass through? What happens if we won't go? He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Guys, the poor of the world will never be able to afford to come here and go to your Bible school. So God has ordained that you could be educated here and go to them. It's not fair for America to sit with 90% of the world's wealth in Bibles and Bible teaching and say, you should come here if you want it. Because that's not who Jesus is. Jesus passed by. Zacchaeus did what he could and what could he do? He climbed a sycamore fig tree. You know, Amos was a piercer of sycamore fig trees, the Bible says. To get a sycamore fig tree to bear any decent fruit, you have to circumcise it. You have to cut the fig so that it can burst open. Otherwise, the fruit just dies on the tree. In every way, this is a, an example of inability, an example of being just short of what God wanted. The good news is with a sycamore fig tree, if you tend to it properly, it can become something that's beautiful. Zacchaeus climbed what he had available. Have you ever seen somebody that didn't know very much about the Lord, but the little bit that they knew, they were clinging to with all of their heart? It's a beautiful thing. Curtis and I have been to places in Africa where they didn't know anything more than the 23rd Psalm, but they memorized the 23rd Psalm. They prayed the 23rd Psalm. They loved their good shepherd, and it's all they knew. You can say, oh, those poor people, that's all they knew. I say poor church for not going and teaching them more. Yes. God has apportioned unto us responsibilities. He wants all men to be saved. This guy climbs the sycamore fig tree. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached, what's that say? When Jesus reached the spot, there is a spot, a certain place, a time and place in a man's life where there's supposed to be an encounter with Jesus. He's run ahead as far as he can go, but he can't run fast enough. He's climbed as high as he can climb, but it's not high enough. He has exhausted himself to become like Jesus, and he can't, and it's in that spot that Jesus will meet him. And it's the most interesting thing. What does he say to him? Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Zacchaeus, you have tried all of your religious work. You've climbed your trees. You've run ahead. And I'm telling you, it's not worth anything except it showed your effort. Now get out of the tree. We're going to have a meeting at your house today. I want you to know that the living God that we serve is not too proud to meet you under a bridge across from the University of Houston behind Spaghetti Warehouse. Do you know how I know? The last time Brent and I slept there, the living God was there with us. Amen. He's not too proud to meet with you in a garbage dump outside Matamoros, Mexico. I've watched him save and fill people with the Holy Ghost there for seven years now. He's not too proud to come and dine with you at your house if you're not too ashamed to have him. What an interesting thing. The fifth verse says, immediately. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. When the Lord calls, you do not have the right to say, I will think about it. When the Lord calls, you don't have the right to say, we'll form a committee and see if it fits with our theology. You don't have the right to take a consensus and see whether or not it meets everyone's approval. If you know you're short, if you know you're a tax collector, if you know that your tree is not tall enough, if you know it won't produce good fruit, then when Jesus speaks, the answer is yes before you even know what he's asked of you. 
Where is your heart with God? Are you still contemplating Him this morning? Are you professing with your lips something that is not in your heart, as Isaiah said? Inasmuch as these people profess me with their lips, their hearts are far from me. Have you covered yourself in fig leaves? Religious speech, but when Jesus calls, you don't come running. One thing about the church in America is we have often learned to say all of the right things while doing none of them. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he is gone to be the guest of sinners. I love the kind of God that could care less what the pretty people think. I don't know about you, but this Ken and Barbie Christianity is getting a little old for me. Jesus was a friend of those that would not be accepted at the country club. He was a friend of those who did not have it all together because they knew they needed him. The prophecy this morning spoke about if you abide in him, the one who keeps his word will be set free. Do you know that John 8, 31 says that he said that to the Jews who already believed in him? The man who holds to his word will be set free. It's not enough to simply know the teachings of Jesus. It's not enough to be able to proclaim the sinner's prayer. Holding to the teachings of Jesus is what shows you to be a son of God. And the world is crying out for us to be revealed. Many times when I meet you, there are a couple of brothers here from another state. And when I look in their eyes, I see the same substance that's in mine. I don't know about them. I don't know whether they're pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, and I don't care. I don't know whether they sprinkle, they dunk, they're fermented, not fermented. I don't know what all their position, and I don't care. I see something that is the same in our eyes. And you know what? The world needs it. They need it. They're yearning for it. They might even be out there slapping faces just waiting for somebody to turn a cheek so they'll know who the sons of God are. God set boundaries for the people so that we would not be too far from each other. He wanted you to be a light to your area. He cares about the Zacchaeuses of the world. Verse 8, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Four times. One thing that I know, our brothers of the Jewish nation, they can count. They count well. They're masters at exchange rates. Numbers 5 and the seventh verse teaches that if you wrong somebody, if you wrong them in a financial matter, you are to pay it back plus 20%. So if you took a dollar from them, you have to pay back $1.20. But Zacchaeus is offering to pay back four to one. You know why? He who sins much loves much. When you know the depths of your sin that you were forgiven from, how can you walk around in harsh judgment towards everyone else? When you know what Jesus has done for you, you want to do things for Jesus. You can't help it. I have to assume that when people are inactive in their faith, when they've ignored Peter's advice to be sober and alert, prepared for action, that it must be because they don't really understand what Jesus has done for them. They must think that they were born pretty much saved and just sealed it with the magical little USDA Christian prayer. But those of us that realize that we were helpless slaves, incapable of doing anything right, and he saved us out of that situation, like Romans 5 says, He demonstrated His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, He died for us. He didn't wait on me to get right. He interjected Himself into my life and He helped me to get right. Amen. How can I hold back 
from a world that needs him so. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. How could Jesus proclaim him saved? He hasn't even prayed. How could Jesus proclaim him saved? He didn't pass a doctrinal test. How could Jesus proclaim him saved? Because the man's faith was shown in his action. Would you put Acts 26, 20 on the screen? I want you all to see this. If you can turn to it, great. If not, it's right here. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also. I preach that they should repent and turn to God. And what's that phrase say? Prove it by their repentance, by their deeds. Zacchaeus was proving that he was repenting by what he was doing. This is often lost in the gospel. It is not a saving faith to simply say, I know that Jesus is Lord. Five out of five demons know that Jesus is Lord. It is not a saving faith to simply be able to quote Romans 10, 9 and 10. It is a saving faith when you have hit a brick wall and you turn from that and relentlessly follow Jesus for the rest of your life because you trust him. Is the king of kings worthy of that? Is he worthy of it, saints? Are you giving him what he's worth? See, that's the question. Is my life measuring up to the high calling of Christ Jesus? I want it to with all my heart, and I pray that yours does. Listen to this last verse. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't come for a spiritual safety deposit box called the church. He didn't come for a neat little aquarium that the fishers of men had given up on and said, we have one of each nation in here, that ought to be good enough. He came to seek and to save what was lost. You know the easiest lost to see, to see saved? Those who know they're lost. One of the things that was just amazing in Peru when we began to speak about repentance in a humble little cinder block church. I don't know what this is. This is also a humble little cinder block church. It's a warehouse. JJ, am I lying? When we talked about repentance, demons began to shriek. Men began to fall on the ground, were delivered on the spot, and filled with the Holy Ghost without ever hearing the words, baptism in the Holy Ghost. Is it true? You know why? They knew they were lost, and they wanted help. In America, you spend all of your time preaching to people who already believe they're saved. It's time to steal your Harriet Tubman quote, Michael, wherever you went. Is it true you freed hundreds of slaves? Yes, and I would have freed thousands if only they had known they were slaves. If we could know our condition, saints, and own up to it, and be honest about it, then there's no limit to what the Lord could do for us, could do in us, could do through us. Maybe we would quit all of our Christian tribal warfare and get busy seeing the lost saved. Turn with me to Luke 10. Is that okay? Zacchaeus had a spot where he met Jesus. I'm going to turn Luke 10 upside down for just a minute if you can bear with me. Is that all right? Oh, is that all right? Y'all can sleep at home. You don't got to sleep here. The chairs are not that comfortable, and I wouldn't have bought the chairs. Somebody donated the money for it. You going to be all right this morning? Brandon, you going to be all right this morning? All right, here comes Luke 10. In Luke 10, we have what is called the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, everybody knows this if you've been in church any, any little bit of time, right? This morning, how about we don't focus on the Good Samaritan for a minute, even though it was Jesus' point. Verse 30, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. What did Jericho represent, Kevin? The world at large. large. What is he doing going from Jerusalem back to the world? He's on the right road, but he's headed the wrong direction. Do you know any Christians like that? They know all the right answers, but their lives are still sliding the wrong way. 
And when you ask them, hey, are you a Christian? Of course, I was saved and baptized. Yeah, the problem is, brother, you look like a thorn bush. Yeah, but I, I mean, I know Jesus is Lord. Well, you may have got on the right road at some point, but you headed the wrong way. Do we know any Christians like that? <laughs> are you a Christian like that? A man was going down. Hear that direction? Down. To a Jew, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going up. Not just because of elevation. It's a spiritual principle. It's the place where God's name dwells. Or is your life ascending towards the name, authority, function, and character of God? Or are you moving down and away from it? A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. How many of you think, oh, how sad? Okay, you're indifferent on it. Let's see. Patricia, do you think that's sad? She thinks it's terrible. Steve, do you think it's sad? Yes. Mike, do you think it's sad? How many is that? Four? Spence, is it sad? Five. Five out of five people think it's sad. I say it's the single best thing that ever happened to this guy. I'd a whole lot rather take a beating that turned me around than be allowed to head in the wrong direction. So many people in the United States are sitting around talking about what a beating they got and how, what a victim they are, and they have not stopped to think maybe God has allowed the adversity in your life to turn you around. What were you doing in your life before the beating came? What direction were you headed? What were you doing? We love to absolve ourselves of sin. And charge God with wrongdoing. I wasn't doing nothing, Dustin, and he just, he's just picking on me. Is it true? No. This guy's headed the wrong way. And God allowed him to fall into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away leaving him. What's that phrase? Half you want to know what half dead is? Get parasites in a foreign country. The only part of you that's alive is what is crawling in your stomach and you wish was dead. Half dead. How can anybody be half dead? One of the brothers said, well, at least you're not lonely with those parasites. You know, got plenty of company. How are you half dead? You're half dead when you have a foot in the world and a foot that used to be in the kingdom. When you're trying to straddle a fence, when you're on the right road, knowing all of the right things, but you're headed the wrong way. You got a foot in death and don't even know it. So God appoints something that will turn you around. Does anybody know who King Asa is? We have to go through Bible lessons today. King Asa was on the right road but started to head the wrong way and God allowed him to get a disease in his feet. And still he would not turn. He sought only the advice of physicians. I'm not here telling you today that God afflicts you. I'm here telling you he puts boundaries in your life. Now, this is going to be hard to believe because my beard's turning gray. What used to be pectorials are now somewhere around the love handles. When I go up and down mountains, I jiggle now. It's, it's sad. I actually itch after a few hours. But there was a time period when, you know what my highest aspiration was? She might remember. I wanted to be a boxer. It's all right. You folks that have some pigment in your skin can go ahead and say white people can't box. We hadn't had a heavyweight since the 70s. White people can't box. <laughs> I wanted to be a boxer. And in the eighth grade, I broke my arm in about 25 places. There are no boxers that have a left jab that is three inches shorter than their right arm. It doesn't happen. God sets boundaries. Now, I might not have needed to set that boundary. I wouldn't have been a boxer anyway, Lawrence. But I was trying. I remember when Matthew and I would be scouted in football. It was happening, right? You get excited, and they do things that build your confidence, right? They send you letters from schools, all kinds. Senior year, all of the people that were proud of us our junior year were not around. And the senior, God set boundaries. He didn't want me to be a member of the Fellowship of Carnal Athletes. He wanted me to be born again. He sets boundaries in our lives so that we'll reach out and find him. And I'm going to tell you, the boundaries usually are when you bump up against what feels like your very worst place. 
and you find out his strength is sufficient for you. You find out that he is the only purpose worth having. If you're not there yet, I can assure you he's able to get you there. What a difficult thing, friends. Are you strong in here this morning? I mean, are you mighty in here this morning? Well, then it might take more to get you to the end of your rope than the others. But he'll do it because he desires that all men be saved. As mighty as the Apostle Paul was, most of the time when he preached the gospel, he came in weakness, fear, and trembling. So that he might learn to rely on that power that worked in him and not on himself, Corinthians says. Why don't you turn with me then to John 8. We'll finally get to our text this morning. Have I made you mad? I'm not done yet. There's still hope. Amen. There you go, Kevin. Kevin, you've been forgiven much? You love much? We got more young men in this church that used to sleep under bridges and in cars and not have family. And you know what? They make the finest Christians. The They're not the kind of men that take for granted that they have Bibles. They're not the kind of men that want the finest clothes. They'll take whatever they can get. And you know why? They're just grateful to be sons of God. Somebody saw hope in them and reached out and rescued them because it's what Jesus would do. And how can we be a part of Christ and not do the works of Christ. Amen. Does anybody know what 1 John 3, 8 says? Anybody can quote it? The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. We can't be participating in the devil's work and destroying the devil's work. We are here to kick down the gates of hell. That's our job. You know why? Mighty King Jesus did it and rescued you from the dominion of darkness. If you're satisfied sitting on your salvation you're not going to be happy here long. I never wanted a big church. I simply wanted those who were distressed and discontented and were willing to receive Jesus at any cost because he takes those and makes them mighty fighting men. And oh man, are some of you beginning to soar. You are, I have a feeling that some of you are going to work on the continents of the world. There's no limit to what the Lord will do with somebody who is crazy enough to not give up and trust Him. There's really not. It doesn't matter where you come from. Your education level will not hold you down in the way that people will tell you that it will. If a man is full of the Holy Ghost, all the potential of God is in him. It's just used at the disposal of God. I told you to go to John 8. In John 8... You might have this little note that says the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have John 7, 53. Do you have that note? Yes. You know what the ancient manuscripts don't have? They don't have a note that says that. You can cross that out. <laughs> we'll read it. If it doesn't bear witness with your spirit, I'll be surprised. Tell me this is not consistent with the character of God. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives... At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in the act. No, it doesn't say that. A woman brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. There we got the act in. That's a yucky scene, isn't it? You have to imagine maybe... Anybody in here remember the show Leave it to Beaver? June and Ward Cleaver. I thought Jennifer grew up in that house for a long time. Her parents uh, never seemed to argue. I mean, mine could throw stuff at each other and they could string together expletives and punch holes in walls. And I mean, my house was crazy, but hers was like, you know... I. It actually turned to black and white when I walked through the door. <laughs> Her ha father had a little sitting chair and a light, and he read. And You know, I mean, they're just cool people. It was, the, it was stability. You have to imagine that kind of setting, though. Socially conservative. What would it be like to be caught in the act of adultery and drugged before the religious people of your day and made to stand there? 
How shameful, huh? I've noticed that the world can be pretty brazen. They show off their bodies. They're like puppets for spiritual powers. What kind of perverse heart drags a person before a mob and says, look what they did? But that's the heart of these religious leaders. The 20th chapter of Leviticus says, if you catch somebody in the act of adultery, bring the adulterer and the adulteress. It doesn't say bring one. They weren't interested in keeping the law or God's righteous requirements. They were interested in trapping Jesus. Even at her expense, this reminds me of religious people arguing over meaningless doctrines, distinctions without a difference, while the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I, I'm an opinionated man, am I not, Jennifer? You can say it, it's yeah. okay. Yeah. I might be the most opinionated man you know, but you know where I lay those things aside? When somebody's dying. When somebody is on fire, it is not worth discussing how we're going to baptize them. Let's save them first. When somebody is on fire, it is not worth discussing whether or not their communion will entail fermented or unfermented grape juice. These are not the most pressing issues of our time. We're forgetting that they are on fire. This woman is a broken soul. She's a broken soul and they didn't care. Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. How shameful it must have been for her to stand there. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. You would think that they wanted to accuse the woman since they drug her up there presumably half naked, huh? But it's really Jesus they're trying to accuse. What does that tell you they already knew about Jesus? He was interested in saving people, not killing them. Are you interested in saving people? How many do we pass by daily? You know, I didn't preach about the parable of the Good Samaritan because you've heard it. You've heard it and heard it and heard it. But in a city like Houston, how many people do we pass by every day that you might have a life-saving word for? You want to know what was the difference between that Samaritan and the priest who passed by? The priest thought to himself, if I stop, it's going to take my time. It's going to take this. I might miss my other very important opportunities. Another of his kind passed by, and he probably thought the same thing. I could be late for dinner. I have a very important church service to perform. But the Samaritan didn't think about what was going to happen to him if he stopped. He thought about what was going to happen to that man if he didn't stop. See, Christianity refocuses our thoughts from an inward thing that says you're a champion and today's Friday and whatever the movie star Christians are saying to something that says more like, what happens to Larry if I don't befriend him? What happens to Lawrence if I don't reach out as Jesus? What would have happened to me if Charlie didn't reach out to me? What would have happened to me if Matthew didn't pray for me? You remember what you were and what God is calling you towards so that you can see potential in the human beings that are around you. I'm going to tell you, in India, I've met some of the most powerful Christians I think are in the kingdom. But you'd pass by them in the mall in Sugar Land every day and never notice them. They're humble men. They don't preach like lions. They don't have deep, thundering voices. They don't have giant biceps. They don't have anything that Americans would love. But when they pray, people get healed. And when they shed tears, it's because God is shedding tears. Many of them have never worn shoes in their life but they're clothed with Christ. Church, we need to open our eyes. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Turn with me to Jeremiah 17. 
Say there when you're there. In Jeremiah 17, pick up with me in verse 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved. For you are the one I praise. Standing before them, there was only one person that understood their true state. The woman who was caught in adultery knew she was guilty. So there's only one person who is going to walk away forgiven because she acknowledged where she was at and she wanted help. She could say, heal me and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved. Everybody wants to know what did Jesus write in the dirt? I think he's writing Jeremiah 17, 13. In John 7, 37, he had announced himself as a spring of living water. He said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. These very same men who did not recognize a fountain of salvation are here accusing a woman who at least knew what she was. The kind of God that we serve will stand between you and the angry mob that wants your death. He will stand between you and Pharaoh's armies. He's not scared to be associated with sinners, but he does not leave you a sinner. When, Jesus, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? You know, the theologians debate. When looking at the book of Revelation, they take that 12th chapter and 10th verse and the question becomes, did this happen in the past or has this happened in the future? Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God. Is the kingdom upon us? Is salvation among us? And the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. This angry mob stood with accusations against the woman. Jesus stood between the accuser, death, and the woman. And he offered her life. He showed that the accuser was guilty himself and dismissed them. You ever read Colossians 1.22? We now stand free from accusation. I'm going to ask you, what separates you from the love of God? What is it? Say, well, the church has said this and done this. Sometimes what is called the church is not his bride. We need to learn the difference between a prostitute and a bride. The bride belongs to the husband. The prostitute is just similar. Just because something has a steeple and a man has a degree, does not mean he's acting on Jesus' behalf. It doesn't. But just because a man says he's a Christian doesn't make him one either. I want to ask you, when were the rocks about to fly in your life? When did the searing conviction of the Holy Ghost fall upon you and you knew you were deserving of death and Jesus step in for you and say, you deserve death but I'm going to take it for you. If that never happened, friends, you might be a member of a religious organization, but you're not born again. If you want to see the kingdom, there's only one way to get there. You know what else? The story doesn't stop here. What else did Jesus tell her? No one, sir, she said, then neither do I condemn you. That's usually where this message stops. Jesus declared... 
Go now, leave your life of sin. What is the proof that you're forgiven? When you turn from your sin and walk in another direction. If you're still subject to the same addiction that you were subject to five years ago, then you are not forgiven. If you are planning to sin next week in the same way that you sinned last week, you are not forgiven. You sit in your sin, regardless of what the TV preachers say who want your money. It comes when you're in a place where you know that you deserve death and you would rather die than continue to sin. He will meet a man like that in the midst of his brokenness and beating, half dead, and he will begin to give you oil and wine. He will come to the very spot where you first say it, and he'll tell you how to get out of your sycamore fig tree and change your life. The living God desires to meet with you today. He determined the exact times and places you would live and work in the hope that you would reach out and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. Turn with me to 1 Samuel. It'll be our last scripture today. Are you tired? Have I bored you? Weak, dead Christianity inoculates us from the real thing. And every once in a while you meet somebody who is so burning with the fire of the Holy Ghost that it challenges something deep in your core. John Wesley met Moravians and afterwards he said his heart was strangely warmed. Smith Wigglesworth got the baptism in the Holy Ghost and although he had done many miracles before it, suddenly something was different and he said that it was almost as if he wasn't saved before. What will take you to that next level? Some of you need to start the race. Some of you haven't even entered in the right way. You never came through the bloody cross. You simply accepted a gospel that said you're a pretty good old boy, and if you add Jesus to your life, it'll all be okay. It's a lie. You cannot add Jesus to your life. You give up your life and you take up his. You pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him. If it hasn't happened, you are not in him. You are still in your sin. And once he's made you righteous, he will pour the power of God into your life. And what used to easily ensnare you and easily enslave you suddenly has no power over you. The week that I left... Charlie and some of the brothers were praying for a man with an addiction at the altar. He went blind in the middle of the prayer, lost all sight, fell on the ground and began to flop around. Then they prayed for him and his sight returned and he was in his right mind. You, these are not parlor tricks, friends. I'm not throwing glitter in the air and breaking open pillows and telling you there's feathers and angel dust in here. The testimony of the demonstration of the power of God is the power of a changed life. It shows up in the sin that no longer masters us. There is no testimony that says, Jesus is my Lord and I am still bound to every sin I was ever bound to. That is not a testimony. And we've passed it off far too long. So you have a choice before you today. David at Nob had a similar choice. It says in 1 Samuel 21, David went to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Ahimelech the priest, The king charged me with a certain matter and said to me, No one is to know anything about your mission and your instructions. As for my men, I have told them to meet me in a certain place. Have you been given a mission, a mandate from God? Are you in the place that he told you to be? Sometimes the Lord speaks to people re fairly regularly. I'm not one of them. Other times he sets a course and he expects you to be where you should be a year from now. You know, I got a bunch of kids, five of them. And my littlest one needs more course correction than my oldest one. But when I tell the oldest one, I'm going to be back in two days and here are the things that I want done, I don't call during those two days.
to make sure they're doing them. I expect them to be done when I get back. But when I tell my littlest one, I need you to clean your room, every seven or eight minutes, I need to go make sure they're cleaning the room. I want you to have a living, abiding, breathing relationship with the Holy Ghost. And I hope he speaks to you every seven or eight minutes, but I'm going to tell you as you mature, he might simply tell you what he wants done and expect you to do it. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth, on a mission, and in a certain place? Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever, or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here. What do you want from God? Do you want ordinary bread? Do you want just whatever you can buy at the Christian bookstore? By the way, have you seen the things that they sell at the Christian bookstore? Yoga for Christians? Really? Grace explosion? I mean, they sell the most ridiculous things I've ever seen at Christian bookstores. You know why? There's a market for it. I want something more than ordinary bread. The Hebrews have a word for when they get in the presence of God. It's called ponium. There's no way to translate it. King James sometimes translated it meat, sometimes showbread. NIV says uh, bread of your presence. It literally means bread of your face. That's strange, isn't it? But it's a Hebrew idiom. It means the nourishment that is better than food that comes from having God turn His countenance towards you. You have a choice. You can settle for ordinary or you can press into the extraordinary. I don't believe we're supposed to live on ordinary bread. I think you're supposed to be living on the words that proceed from God's mouth. I love the Bible, but I'm going to tell you there's even a difference there. Have you ever read a scripture and you're like, but, but is that for me now? Versus one that he brings to you in the moment and shows you in the word? A kind of logos versus rhema thing? We're supposed to get daily bread. Maybe the reason that the church acts so silly sometimes is it's weak and emaciated. It has commentary upon commentary, but no daily bread. Are you doing your part to get your daily bread? Are you sitting around proclaiming yourself a champion, never having eating, eaten from the presence of God? 30, 60, and what's the next one? 100 fold. 100 fold. Was a seed planted in you? Who in here had something of heaven planted in them? Has he gotten back at least 30? Has he gotten back 60? Has he gotten back 100 times what he put in you? Are you feasting from the abundance of his table? Are you settling for an ordinary life saying, well, I got mine? Christianity is centrifugal. It has to spread outward. It has to start in Jerusalem move to Judea, then to Samaria, then to the end of the world, or it's not authentic. It's leaven that once you put it in a loaf, it spreads to take over the whole loaf. It's a rock cut out of a mountain that fills the whole earth, or else it was not the genuine rock. Have you eaten of the presence of God so that you can take it everywhere you go? Get baptized in the Holy Ghost, amen. They got baptized in the Holy Ghost then lived together in miraculous power for 10 years so that they knew what it looked like as a community. You engaging in the community of God or are you some kind of strange weekend warrior that shows up here and does your message and then leaves? All in my heart, I want you to succeed. Are you getting out of life the things that you believe God has for you? Are you just coasting by on ordinary bread? David replied, Indeed, the women have been kept from us as usual whenever I set out. The men's things are holy even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? 
So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Edomite. Anybody in here name their kid Doeg? I just want to make sure before I make fun of this name. Doeg. It's funny, isn't it, Libby? Just to say Doeg. His name could be Doofus. Doeg. Does Doeg strike you as bright, happy, exciting, spirit-filled, and powerful? Doeg. He was Doeg the Edomite, Saul's head shepherd. You have a choice between kinds of shepherds in this world. You can pick Doeg, who is an Edomite, a descendant of sellouts, who never valued the real spiritual blessing of God. They simply wanted their bowl of beans. Give me my today's portion. Or you could have a shepherd like David, a man that God would raise up that would do whatever God told him to do. And you need to know something. It's an important choice. When you choose to be ruled by Saul's shepherd, Doeg, everything gives birth according to its kind. If what you want is health, wealth, and prosperity, then you'll probably get it. Health, wealth, and prosperity, and that's all you'll get. If what you want is the extraordinary substance of heaven and you're willing to give away health, wealth, and prosperity. See, I'm not looking to receive health, wealth, and prosperity. I'm looking to give it all away, to pour my life out to the very last ounce because he's worth it. Amen. Ordinary bread or extraordinary bread? Doeg or David? See, there's always a counterfeit, friends. There is a counterfeit Christianity. The Bible calls it the whore of Babylon. There's one more thing that David asked for before he left, and it's something that none of us should leave here today without. David asked Ahimelech, Do you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's business was urgent. When the king calls, we come running. We trust him for our provision. We don't bring our beef jerky. Because what he provides is better than what you could have brought. If you lean on Peter's sword, then all you'll have is Peter's sword. If you lean on the armies of heaven, then you'll have the armies of heaven. The priest replied, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. It is wrapped in a cloth because behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. You have a choice today between leaving with extraordinary bread or ordinary bread. Leaving committed to follow the spiritual king David or the Edomite shepherd Doeg, you have a choice to have a sword in your hand or to go away empty-handed simply called the champion. By the way, if he's on a mission from the king and he came to a certain place, do you think it's any mistake that the sword he took from Goliath happened to be there? Saints, if you're a little beat up, If maybe you're not right where you thought you would be in life right now, it might be worth looking backwards a little bit at the giants he's already slain before you. Amen. Is there an old sword somewhere laying around that you've forgotten what the Lord did for you? I've noticed in Christianity God can liberate you from financial distress. He can save your soul. He can heal you of a cardiac arrest. You get a splinter and all you can talk about is the splinter you got. Sometimes it's worth looking backwards at what he has already done for you. Before David went on this next journey, he left with consecrated bread. He left an enemy of Doeg and not a friend. And he left with a sword 
that is a testimony to the Lord's victory every time he trusted him. What are you going to leave this building with today? It's up to you. Matthew, would you come up here and lead worship? It's up to you. You'll get out of these meetings whatever you want. You can walk away and eat your pastor just like the fried chicken after, after church. You can talk about every scripture I misquoted. You can talk about how lame it was, how difficult it was, and that's what you'll get. You'll get a lame, difficult service. Or you can press in to the power of God. And that's what you will get because he delights in giving you the kingdom. He desires that all men would be saved. Don't leave here not right with him. Y'all stand to your feet.